my fellow clergymen, while confined here in Birmingham City Jail, I came across your recent statement calling my present activities unwise and untimely. Seldom do I pause to answer criticisms of my work and idea. If I thought to answer all the criticism that crossed my desk, my secretary would have little time for anything other than correspondence in the course of the day. And I would have no time for constructive work. But since I feel that you are men of genuine goodwill, and that your criticism are sincerely set forth. I want to try to answer your statement in what I hope will be patient and reasonable terms. I think I should indicate why I'm here in Birmingham, since you have been influenced by the view which argues against outsiders coming in. I have the honor of serving as president of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference organization operating in every Southern state with headquarters in Atlanta, Georgia. We have some 85 affiliated organizations across the South, and one of them is Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights. Frequently, we are staffed educational and financial resources with our affiliates. Several months ago, the affiliate here in Birmingham asked us to be on call to engage in a nonviolent direct action program if such were deemed necessary. We readily, readily consented, and when the hour came, we lived up to our problem. So I, along with several members of my staff, am here because I was invited here. I'm here because I have organizational ties here. But more basically, I'm here in Birmingham because injustice is here. Just as the prophets of the 8th century BC left their villages and carried their thus said the Lord far beyond the boundaries of their hometowns. And just as the apostle Paul left his village of Tarshish and carried the gospel of Jesus Christ to far corners of the Greek or Roman world, so am I compelled to carry the gospel of freedom beyond my home hometown. Like Paul, I was constantly responding to the Macedonia call for aid. Moreover, I am cognizant of the interrelatedness of all communities and states. I cannot sit idly by in Atlanta and not be concerned about the happens in Birmingham. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We ought to, in an inescapable network of mutuality, tie in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. Never again can we afford to live with the narrow, provincial, outside agitator idea. Anyone who lives in the United States can never be considered an outsider anywhere within this bounds. You deplore the demonstration taking place in Birmingham, but your statement, I am sorry to say, fails to express a similar concern for the condition that brought about the demonstration. I am sure that none of you would want to rest content with the superficial kind of social analyst that deals merely with effects and does not grapple with underlying causes. It is unfortunate that demonstrations are taking place in Birmingham, but it is even more unfortunate that the city white power structure left the Negro community with no alternative. In any nonviolent campaign, there are four basic steps. Collection of the facts to determine whether injustice exists, negotiation, self-purification, and direct action. We have gone through all these steps in Birmingham. There can be no gainsaying the fact that racial injustice engulfs this community. 
Birmingham, probably the most thoroughly segregated city in the United States. Its ugly records of brutality is widely known. Negroes have experienced grossly unjust treatment in the courts. There have been more unsolved bombings in Negro homes and churches in Birmingham than in any other city in the nation. These are the hard, brutal facts of the case. On the basis of these conditions, Negro leaders sought to negotiate with the city fathers, but the latter consistently refused to engage in good faith negotiation. Then last September came the opportunity to talk with leaders of Birmingham economic community. In the course of the negotiation, certain promises were made by the merchants, for example, to remove the store's humiliating racial signs. On the basis of these promises, the Reverend Fred Shuttleworth and the leaders of the Alabama Christian Movement for Human Rights agreed to a monitorium on all demonstrations. As the weeks and months went by, we realized that we were uh, the victims of a broken promise. A few signs briefly removed return. The other remained. As in so many past experiences, our hope has been blasted and the shadow of deep disappointment settled upon us. We had no alternative except to prepare for direct action, whereby we would present our very bodies as a means of lying our case before the conscience of the social, local, and the national community. Mindful of the difficulties involved, we decided to undertake a process of self-purification. In a series of workshop of nonviolence, and we repeatedly asked ourselves, are you able to accept blows without retaliating? Are you able to endure the ordeal of jail? We decided to schedule our direct action program for the Easter season, realizing that except for Christmas, this is the main shopping period of the year. Knowing that a strong economic withdrawal program would be the product of direct action, we felt that this would be the best time to bring pressure to bear on the merchants for the needed change. Then it occurred to us that Birmingham mayoral election was coming up in March, and we speedily decided to postpone action until after the election day. We discovered that the Commissioner of Public Safety, Eugene Bull Connors, had piled up enough votes to be in the runoff. We decided again to postpone action until the day after the runoff so that the demonstration could not be used to cloud the issue. Like many others, we waited to see Mr. Connors defeated. And to this end, we endured postponement after postponement. Having aided in this community need, we felt that our direct action program could be delayed no longer. You may well ask why direct action? Why sit-ins, marches, and so forth? Is a negotiation a better path? You are quite right in calling for negotiation. Indeed, this is the very purpose of direct action. Non-violent direct actions seeks to create such a crisis and foster such tension that a community which has constantly refused to negotiate is forced to confront the issue. It seeks so to dramatize the issue that it can no longer be ignored. My citing the creation of tension as part of the work of the nonviolent register uh, may sound rather shocking, but I must confess that I am not afraid of the word tension. I have earnestly opposed violent tension. But there is a type of constructive, nonviolent tension which is necessary for growth. Just as Socrates felt that it was necessary to create a tension in the mind so that individuals 
to rise from the bondage of myths and half truth to the unfettered realm of creative analysts and objective appraisal. So must we see the need for nonviolent gat flies to create the tent kind of tension in society that will help men rise from the dark depths of prejudice and racism to the majestic heights of understanding and brotherhood. Purpose of our direct action program is to create a situation so crisis packed that it will inevitably open the door to negotiation. I therefore concur with you in your call for negotiation. Too long has our beloved Southland been bogged down in a traffic effort, tragic efforts to live in monologue rather than dialogue. One of the basic points in your statement is that the action that I and my associates have taken in Birmingham is untimely. Some have asked, why didn't you give the new city administration time to act? The only answer that I can give to this inquiry is that the new Birmingham administration must be prodded about as much as the outgoing one before it will act. We are sadly mistaken if we feel that the election of Albert Boswell as mayor will bring the millennium to Birmingham. While Mr. Botwell is a much more general person than Mr. Connor, they are both segregationists dedicated to maintenance of the status quo. I have hope that Mr. Botwell will be reasonable enough to see the futility of massive resistance to desegregation, but he will not see this without pressure from devotees of civil rights. My friends, I must say to you that we have not made a single gain in civil rights without determined legal nonviolent pressure. Lamentable. It is an historical fact that privileged groups seldom give up their privileges voluntarily. Individuals may see the moral light and voluntarily give up their unjust posture. But as Reinhold Niebuhr has reminded us, groups tend to be more immoral than individuals. We know through painful experience that freedom is never voluntarily given by oppressor. It must be demanded by the oppressed. Frankly, I have yet to engage in a direct action campaign that was well-timed in the view of those who have not suffered unduly from the disease of segregation. For years now, I have heard the word wait. It rings in the ear of every Negro with piercing familiarity. This wait has always meant never. We must come to see with one of our distinguished jurists that justice too long delayed is justice denied. We have waited for more than 340 years of our constitutional and God-given rights. The nations of Asia and Africa are moving like jet light speed towards gaining political independence, but we will still creep at horse and buggy pace towards gaining a cup of coffee at a lunch counter. Perhaps it is easy for those who have never felt the stinging darts of segregation to say, wait, when you have been vicious mobs, lynched your mother and fathers at will and drown your sisters and brothers at whim, when you have seen hate-filled policemen curse, kick, and even kill your black brothers and sisters, when you see the vast majority of your 20 million Negro brothers smothering in an airtight cage of poverty in the midst of an affluent society, when you suddenly find your tongue twisted and your speech stammering as you seek to explain to your six your old daughter, why she can't go to the public museum park that has just been advertised on television and see tears swelling up in her eyes when she is told that Fun Town is closed to colored children and see an ominous clouds of inferiority beginning to form in her little mental sky. 
and see her beginning to distort her personality by developing an unconscious bitterness towards white people. When you have to concoct an answer for a five-year-old son who is asking, Daddy, why do white people treat colored people so mean? When you take a cross-country drive and find it necessary to sleep night after night in an uncomfortable corner of your most automobile because no motel will accept you. When you are humiliated day in and day out by nagging signs reading white and colored. When your first name become nigga, your middle name become boy, however old you are. And your last name becomes John and your wife and mother are never given the respect title missus when you are hurried by day and haunted by night by the fact that you are a Negro living constantly at tiptoe stamps, never quite knowing what to expect next, and are plagued with inner fears and out of resentment. When you are forever fighting a degenerating sense of nobodyness, then you will understand why we find it difficult to wait. There comes a time when the cup of endurance runs over and men no longer will be uh, plunged into the abyss of despair. I hope, sirs, you can understand our legitimate and unavoidable impatience. We express a great deal of anxiety over our willingness to break laws. This is certainly a legitimate concern. Since we so diligently urged people to obey the Supreme Court decision of 1954, outlawing segregation in the public school. At first glance, it may seem rather paradoxical for us consciously to break laws. One may well ask, how can you advocate breaking some laws and obeying others? Answer lies in the fact that there are two types of laws, just and unjust. I will be the first to advocate obeying just laws, one has not only a legal, but a moral responsibility to obey just laws. Conversely, one has a moral responsibility to disobey unjust laws. I would agree with St. Augustine that an unjust law is no law at all. Now, what is the difference between the two? How does one determine whether a law is just or unjust? This law is a man-made code that squares with the moral law or the law of God. An unjust law is a code that is out of harmony with the moral law. To put it in the terms of St. Thomas Aquinas, an unjust law is a human law that is not rooted in eternal law and natural law. Any law that uplifts human personality is just. Any law that degrades human personality is unjust. All segregation statutes are unjust because segregation distorts the soul and damages the personality. It gives the segregator a false sense of superiority and the segregated a false sense of inferiority. Segregation, to use the terminology of the Jewish philosopher Martin Huber, substitutes an I-it relationship for I-thou relationship and ends up uh, regulating persons to the status thing. Hence, segregation is not only politically, economically, socially unsound, it is morally wrong and sinful. Paul Tillich has said that sin is separation. It's not segregation and it's sensual expression of man's tragic separation, his awful estrangement, his terrible sinfulness. Thus, it is that I can urge men to obey the 1954 decision of the Supreme Court, for it is morally right. And I can urge them to disobey 
segregation ordinances, for they are morally wrong. Let us consider a more concrete example of just and unjust laws. An unjust law is a code that a numeral of power majority groups compels a majority, a minority group to obey, but does not make binding on itself. This is different made legal. By the same token, a just law is a code that a majority compels a minority to follow and that it is willing to follow itself. This is sameness made legal. Let me give another example, an explanation. A law is unjust if it is inflicted on a minority that as a result of being denied the right to vote, had no part in enacting or devising the law. Who can say that the legislation of Alabama, which set up the state segregation laws, was democratically elected? Throughout Alabama, all sorts of devious methods are used to prevent Negroes from becoming registered voters. And there are some countries in which even though Negroes constitute a majority of the population, not a single Negro is registered. And any law enacted under such circumstances be considered democratically structured. Sometimes a law is just on its face and unjust in its application. For instance, I have been arrested on a charge of parading without a permit. Now there is nothing wrong in having an ordinance which requires a permit for a parade, but such an ordinance become unjust when it is used to maintain segregation and to deny citizens the First Amendment privilege of peaceful assembly and protest. I hope you are able to see the distinction I am trying to point out. In no sense do I advocate evading or defying the law as would the rabid segregationist that would lead to anarchy. One who breaks an unjust law must do so openly, lovingly, and with a willingness to accept the penalty. I submit that an individual who breaks a law that conscience tells him is unjust and who willingly accept the penalty of imprisonment in order to arouse the conscience of the community over its injustice is in reality expressing the highest respect for law. Of course, there is nothing new about this kind of civil disobedience. It was evident subliminally in the refusal of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to obey the laws of Nebuchadnezzar on the grounds that a higher moral law was at stake. It was practice of suburbly by the early church who were willing to face hungry lions and the excruciating pain of chopping blocks rather than submit to certain unjust laws of the Roman Empire. To a degree, academic freedom is a reality today because Socrates practiced civil disobedience. Our own nation, the Boston Tea Party represented a massive act of civil disobedience. We should never forget a, a, that everything Adolf Hitler did in Germany was legal, and everything the Hungarian freedom fighter did in Hungary was illegal. It was illegal to aid and comfort a Jew in Hitler's Germany. Even so, I am sure that had I lived in Germany at the time, I would have aided and comforted my Jewish brothers. If today I live in a communist country where certain principles dear to the Christian faith are suppressed, I will openly advocate disobeying that country's anti-religious laws. I must make two honest confessions to you, my Christian and Jewish brothers. First, I must confess that over the past few years, I have been gravely disappointed with a white moderate. I have also reached the irregrettable conclusion that the Negro great stumbling block in his stride towards freedom is not the white citizen 
counselor or the Ku Klux Klaner, but the white moderate who is more devoted to order than to justice, who prefer a negative peace, which is the absence of tension to a positive peace, which is the presence of justice. He constantly says, I agree with you in the goal you seek, but I cannot agree with your method of direct action, who uh, paternalistically believes he can set the timetable for another man's freedom, who lives by a mythical concept of time and who constantly advises the Negro to wait for a more convenient season. Shadow understanding from people of goodwill is more frustrating than absolute misunderstanding from people of ill will. Lukewarm acceptance is much more bewildering than outright rejection. I had hope that the white modern would understand the law and order for the purpose of establishing justice, and that when they fail in this purpose, they become the dangerously structured dams that block the flow of social progress. I had hoped that the white moderates would understand that the present tension in the South is a necessary phase of the transition from an obnoxious, a negative peace, which the Negro passively accepted uh, his unjust plight to a substantive and positive peace in which all men will respect the dignity and worth of human personality. Actually, we who engage in nonviolent direct actions are the creators of tension. We merely bring to the surface the hidden tension that is already alive. We bring it out in the open where it can be seen and dealt with, like a boil that can never be cured so long as it is covered up, but must be open with all its ugliness to the natural medicines of air and life. And justice must be exposed with all the tension its exposure creates to the light of human conscience and the air of national opinion before it can be cured. In your statement, you assert that our action, even though peaceful, must be condemned because they are precipitate violence. Is this a logical assertion? Isn't this like condemning a robbed man because his possession of money precipitate the evil act of robbery? Is it this like condemning Socrates because his unswerving commitment to truth and his philosophical inquiry precipitated the act by the misguided populace in which they made him drink hemlock? Is it this like condemning Jesus because his unique God consciousness and never ceasing devotion to God? will precipitate the evil act of crucifixion. We must come to see that, as the federal courts have consistently affirmed, it is wrong to urge an individual to cease his efforts to gain his basic constitutional rights because the quest may precipitate violence. Society must protect the robbed and punish the robber. I had also hoped that the white moderate would reject the myth concerning time in relation to the struggle for freedom. I have just received a letter from a white brother in Texas. He writes, all Christians know that the colored people will receive equal rights eventually, but it is possible that you are in too great a religious hurry. It has taken Christianity almost 2000 years to accomplish what it has. The teaching of Christ take time to come to earth. Such an attitude stems from a tragic misconception of time, from the strangely irrational notion that there is something in the very flow of time that will inevitably cure all ills. Actually, time itself is neutral. It can be used neither destructively or constructively. More and more, I feel that the people of ill will have used time much more effectively than have the people of good will. We will have to repent in this generation, not merely for the hateful words and action of bad people, but for the appalling silence 
of the good people. Human progress never rolls in on wheels of inedibility. It comes through the tireless effort of men willing to be co-workers with God. And without this hard work, time itself becomes an ally of the forces of social stagnation. We must use time creatively in the knowledge that the time is always right to do right. Now the time to make real the promise of democracy and transform our pending nation elegy uh, into a creative song of brotherhood. Now is the time to lift our nation policy from the quicksand of racial injustice to the solid rock of human dignity. You speak of our activity in Birmingham as extreme. At first, I was rather disappointed that fellow clergymen would see my nonviolent effort as those of an extremist. I began thinking about the fact that I stand in the middle of two opposing forces in the Negro community. One is a force of complacency made up in part of Negroes who as a result of long years of oppression are so drained of self-respect and a sense of somebodyness that they have adjusted to segregation. And in part of a few middle-class Negroes who because of a degree of academic and economic security and because in some ways they profit by segregation have become insensitive to the problem of the masses. The other force is one of bitterness and hatred, and it comes perilously close uh, to advocating violence. It is expressed in the various black nationalist groups that are springing up across the nation, the largest and best known being Elijah Muhammad's Muslims movement. Nourished by the Negro frustration over the continued existence of radical discrimination, this movement is made up of people who have lost faith in America, who have absolutely repudiated Christianity and have concluded that the white man is an incorrigible devil. I've tried to stand between these two forces, saying that we need to emulate neither the do nothingnessism or the complacent nor the hatred and despair of black nationals. But there is the more excellent way of love and nonviolent protest. I am grateful to God that through the influence of the Negro church, the way of nonviolence became an integral part of our struggle. If this uh, philosophy had not emerged uh, by now many streets of the South would, I am convinced, be flowing with blood. And I am further convinced that if our white brother dismissed as rabble rousers and outside agitators, those of us who employ nonviolent direct action, and if they refuse to support our nonviolent efforts, millions of Negroes will, out of frustration and despair, seek solace and security in black nationalist ideologies, a development that would inevitably lead to a frightening racial nightmare. Oppressed people cannot remain oppressed forever. Journey for freedom eventually manifests itself, and that is what happens to the American Negro. Something within has reminded him of his birthright of freedom, and something without has reminded him it can be gained. Consciously or unconsciously, he has been taught up by the Zetius than with the Black brothers of Africa and with his brown and yellow brothers of Asia and South America and the Caribbeans, the United States Negro is moving with a sense of great urgency towards the promised land of racial justice. If one recognizes this vital urge that has engulfed the Negro community, one should readily understand why public demonstrations are taking place. The Negro has many a pent up resentments and latent frustration, he must release them. So let him march, let him make prayer privileges 
to the city hall. Let him go on freedom rise and try to understand why he must do so. If his repressed emotions are not released in a nonviolent ways, they will seek expression through violence. This is not a threat, but a fact of history. So I have not said to my people, get rid of your discontent. Rather, I have tried to say that this normal and healthy discontent can be channeled into the creative outlet of nonviolent direct action. And now this approach is being termed extremist. But though I was initially disappointed at being categorized as an extremist, as I continued to think about the matter, I gradually gained a measure of satisfaction from the label. Was not Jesus an extremist for love? Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Was not Amos an extremist for justice? Let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Was not Paul an extremist for the Christian gospel? I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Was not Martin Luther an extremist? Here I stand. I cannot do otherwise, so help me God. And John Bunyan, I will stay in jail to the end of my days before I make a butchery of my conscience. Abraham Lincoln, this nation cannot survive half slave and half free. Thomas Jefferson, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. So the question is not whether we will be extremists, but what kind of extremists will we be? Will we be the extremists for hate or for love? Will we be extremists for the preservation of injustice or for the extension of justice? In that dramatic scene on Calvary Hill, three men were crucified. We must never forget that all three were crucified for the same crime the crime of extremism. Two were extremists for immorality and thus fell below the environment. The other, Jesus Christ, was an extremist for love, truth, and goodness, and thereby rose above his environment. After South, the nation, and the world are in dire need of creative extremists. I had hoped that the white moderate would see the need Perhaps I was too optimistic. Perhaps I expected too much. I suppose I should have realized that few members of the oppressor race can understand the deep groans and passionate yearnings of the oppressed race, and still fewer have the vision to see that injustice must be rooted out by strong, persistent, and determined action. I am thankful, however, that some of our white brothers in the South have grasped the meaning of this social revolution and committed themselves to it. They are still all too few in quantity. They are big in quality. Some, such as Ralph McGill, Lillian Smith, Harry Golden, James McBride Dabbs, Ann Braden, Sarah Payton Boyle, have written about our struggle in eloquent and prophetic, prophetic terms. Others have marched with us down nameless streets of the South. They have languished in filthy, roach-infested jail, suffering the abuse and brutality of policemen who view them as dirty niggers lovers. Unlike so many of their moderate brothers and sisters, they have recognized the urgency of the moment and since the need for powerful action antidotes to combat the disease of segregation. Let me take note of my other major disappointment. I have been so greatly disappointed with the white church and its leadership. Of course, there are some notable exceptions. I am not unmindful of the fact that each of you has <clears throat> taken some significant stand on this issue. I commend you, Reverend Stalling, 
for your Christian stand on this past Sunday and welcoming Negroes to worship service on a non-segregated basis. I commend the Catholic leaders of the state for integrating Spring Hill College several years ago. But despite these notable exceptions, I must honestly reiterate that I have been disappointed with the church. I do not say this as one of those negative critics who can always find something wrong with the church. I say this as a minister of the gospel who loved the church, who was nurtured in its bosom, who has been sustained by its spiritual blessing and who will remain true to it as long as the cord of life shall lengthen. When I was suddenly decapitated into the leadership of the bus protests in Montgomery, Alabama a few years ago, I felt we would be supported by the white church. I felt that the white minister, priests, and rabbits of the South would be amongst the strongest allies. Instead, some have been outright, outright opponents refusing to understand the freedom movement and misrepresenting its leaders. All too many others have been more cautious than courageous and have remained silent behind the anesthesia and security of stained glass windows. In spite of my shattered dreams, I came to Birmingham with the hope that the white religious leaders of this community would see the justice of our cause, but deep moral concern would serve as a channel through which our just grievances could reach the power structure. I had had hope that each of you would understand but again, I have been disappointed. I have heard numerous Southern religious leaders admonish their worshipers to comply with a desegregation decision because it is the law. But I have longed to hear white minister declare, follow this decree because integration is morally right and because the Negro is your brother. In the midst of blatant injustice inflicted upon the Negro, I have watched white church men stand on the sideline, mouth pious irreverencies and sanctimonious tributarities in the midst of a mighty struggle to rid our nation of racial and economic injustice. I've heard many ministers say, those are social issues with which the gospel has no real concern. And I have watched many churches commit themselves to a completely otherworldly religion, which makes a strange, unbiblical distinction between body and soul, between the sacred and the secular. I have traveled the length and breadth of Alabama, Mississippi, and all the other southern states, sweltering summer days, quest autumn mornings. I have looked at the South beautiful churches with their lofty spears pointing heavenward. I have beheld the impressive outlines of her massive religious education building. And over and over, I found myself asking what kind of people worship here? Who is their God? <laughs> Where is their voices when the lips of Governor Barnett drip? with words of interposition and nullification? Where were there when Governor Wallace gave a clarion call for defiance and hatred? Where were there voices of support when bruised and weary Negro men and women decided to rise from the dark dungeons of complacency to the bright hills of creative protest? Yes, these questions are still in my mind, in deep disappointment, I have wept over the laity of the church. But be assured that my tears have been tears of love. There can be no deep disappointment where there is no deep love. Yes, I love the church. How could I do otherwise? I'm in a rather unique position of being the son of the grandson and the great-grandson of preachers. 
He see, yes, I see the church as the body of Christ. But oh, how we have blemished and scarred that body through social neglect and through fear of being non-conformities. There was a time when the church was a very powerful and the time when the early Christian rejoiced at being deemed worthy to suffer for what they believed. In those days, the church was not merely a thermometer that recorded the ideal and principles of popular opinion. It was a thermostat that transformed the mores of society. Whenever the early Christian entered a town, the people in power became disturbed and then immediately sought to convict the Christians of being uh, disturbers of the peace and an outside agitator. But the Christian pressed on in the conviction that they were a colony of heaven, called to obey God rather than man. Small in number, they were big in commitment. They were too God intoxicated to be astronomically intimidated. By their efforts and example, they brought an end to such ancient evils and infanticides and gladiatorial contests. Things are different now. So often the contemporary church is a weak, ineffectual voice with an uncertain sound. So often it is an arch defender of the status quo. Far from being disturbed by the presence of the church, the power structures of the average community is consoled by the church silence and often even vocal sanction of things as they are. But the judgment of God is upon the church as never before. If today's church does not recapture the sacrificial spirit of the early church, it will lose its authenticity, forfeit the loyalty of millions, and be dismissed as an irrelevant social club with no meaning for the 20th century. Every day I meet young people whose disappointment with the church has turned into outright disgust. Perhaps I have once again been too optimistic. It's organized religion to inextricably bound to the status quo to save our nation and the world. Perhaps I must turn my faith to the inner spiritual church, the church within the church, as the true ecclesiast and the hope of the world. But again, I am thankful to God that some noble souls uh, from the ranks of organized religion have broken loose from the paralyzing chains of conformity and join us as an active partner in the struggle for freedom. They have left their secure congregations and walked the streets of Albany, Georgia with us. They have gone down the highways of the South on torturous rides for freedom. Yes, they have gone to jail with us. Some have been dismissed from their churches, have lost the support of their bishop and fellow ministers, but they have acted in the faith that right defeated is stronger than evil triumphs. Their witness has been the spiritual salt that has preserved the true meaning of the gospel in these troubled times. They have carved a tunnel of hope through the dark mountains of disappointment. I hope the church as a whole will meet the challenge of this decisive hour. But even if the church does not come to the aid of justice, I have no despair about the future. I have no fear about the outcome of our struggle in Birmingham. Even if our motives are not present misunderstood, we will reach the goal of freedom in Birmingham and all over the nation because the goal of America is freedom. Abuse and scorn, though we may be, our destiny is tied up with America's destiny. Before the pilgrim landed at Plymouth, we were here. Before the pen of Jefferson etched the majestic words of the Declaration of Independence across the pages of history, we were here. For more than two centuries, our forebears labor in this country without wages. They made cotton king. They built the homes of their masters while suffering loss 
gross injustice and shameful humiliation. And yet out of a bottomless vitality, they continue to strive and develop. If the inexpressible cruelty of slavery could not stop us, the opposition we now face will surely fail. We will win our freedom because the sacred heritage of our nation and the eternal will of God are embodied in our echoing demands. Before closing, I feel impelled to mention one other point in your statement that has troubled me profoundly. You warn, warmly commended the Birmingham police force for keeping order and preventing violence. I doubt that you would have so warmly commended the police force if you had seen this dog sinking their teeth into unarmed, nonviolent Negroes. I doubt that you would so quickly commend the policemen if you were to observe their ugly and inhuman treatment of Negroes here in the city jail. If you were to watch them push and curse old Negro women and young Negro girls, if you were to see them slap and kick old Negro men and young boys, if you were to observe them as they did on two occasions, refuse to give us food because we wanted to sing our grace together, I cannot join you in your praise of the Birmingham Police Department. It is true that the police have exercised a degree of discipline in handling the demonstrators in the sense they have conducted themselves rather nonviolently in public. But for what purpose? To preserve the evil system of segregation. Over the past few years, I have consistently preached that nonviolent demands that the means we use must be as pure as the end we seek. I've tried to make clear that it is wrong to use immoral means to obtain moral ends. But now I must affirm that it is just as wrong, or perhaps even more so, to use moral means to preserve immoral ends. Perhaps Mr. Connors and his policemen have been rather nonviolent in public, as was Chief Pritchett in Alabama, Albany, Georgia but they have used the moral means of nonviolence to maintain the immoral end of racial injustice. As T.S. Eliot has said, the last temptation is the greatest treason, to do the right deed for the wrong reason. I wish you had commended the Negro sit-inners and dis the demonstrators of Birmingham for their sublime courage their willingness to suffer their amazing discipline in the midst of great provocation. One day the South will recognize its real heroes. They will be the James Merrith with the noble sense of purpose that enables them to face jeering and hostile mobs and with the agonizing loneliness that characterizes the life of the pioneer. They will be the old, oppressed, battered Negro women, symbolized in a 72-year-old woman in Montgomery, Alabama, who rose up with a sense of dignity and with her people decided not to ride segregated buses and who responded with ungrammatically profundity to one who inquired about her weariness. My feet is tired, but my soul is at rest. They will be the young high school and college students, the young ministers of the gospel and a host of their elders, courageously and nonviolently sitting in at lunch counters and willingly going to jail for conscience sake. One day the South will know that when these disinherited children of God sat down at lunch counters, they were in reality standing up for what is the best in the American dream and for the most sacred values in this Judeo-Christian heritage, thereby bringing our nation back to those great wells of democracy, which were dug deep by the founding fathers, their formulation of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. Never before have I written so long a letter. 
I'm afraid it is much too long to take your precious time. I can assure you that it would have been much shorter if I had been writing from a comfortable desk. But what else can one do when he is alone in a narrow jail cell? Others than write long letters, think long thoughts, and pray long prayers. If I have said anything in this letter that overstates the truth, and indicates an unreasonable impatience. I beg you to forgive me. If I have said anything that understates the truth and indicates by having a patience that allows me to settle for anything less than brotherhood, I beg God to forgive me. I hope this letter finds you strong in the faith. I also hope that circumstances will soon make it possible for me to meet each of you, not as an integrity, or a civil rights leader, but as a fellow clergyman and a civil, a Christian brother. Let us all hope that the dark clouds of racial prejudice will soon pass away and the deep fog of misunderstanding will be lifted from our fear-drenched communities. And in some not too distant tomorrow, the radiant stars of love and brotherhood will shine over our nation with all their Sustelliating beauty. Yours for the cause of peace and brotherhood, Martha Luther King, June.